we will get our meeting called to order. Thank you for joining us this evening. And with that, we'll have roll call. All board members are present. Thank you. Next, we have the Pledge of Allegiance. And I do ask that following the pledge, we remain standing for a moment of silence. We've had a couple very tragic losses this week to our Carmel Clay School family. And we would like to recognize and, and you know, count the blessings that we have. So we'll start with our pledge. First item on the agenda is consent. May I have a motion to approve consent? So moved. Second? Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Next on our agenda, we have reports. And I would say the only big report that we have to share would be policy. Pam and I started resuming our policy meetings. We will have a few to bring forward at our next board meeting. Um, one of the policies that we've been looking at, and it has been ongoing, was the, or is, the boundaries for the districts, mm -hmm. for the election districts. Right. Um, this would be the time to address that since we are not in an election year for our school board candidates. Um, well, at least for the districts. Right. Yes, thank you. And the last time that had been addressed was in 1984. And since then, we've had a lot of growth in Carmel, and the population for each of the districts is skewed. One of them is almost twice as much as another. So um, we've worked with the county surveyor and have come up with a plan, and so we'll be sharing that with the board. Following that, we've got our workshop topic, and with that, we'll turn to Dr. Dudley. Thank you. Uh, this evening, we are excited to have um, several of our teachers here to share with you um, a little glimpse of what happens with, in writing instruction, kindergarten all the way through eighth grade. So I'll introduce them and then I'll turn it over to Dr. McFarland. We have Dr. McFarland. We have um, Ms. Laura Chin, who is our instructional coach interventionist at Forestdale. We have Mrs. Amy Morrison, um, who is a second grade teacher at Forestdale. We have Ms. Julie Arnold, who is a fifth grade teacher at Forestdale. Mrs. Becky White, a kindergarten teacher at Forestdale. We have Rachel Harder, who is a seventh grade English language arts teacher. And we have Mrs. Ramona Rice, who is an eighth grade English language arts teacher and the department chair at Carmel Middle. So I'll turn it over to And we have, for um, support, we have Mrs. Deanna Pittman, who is the principal at Forestdale. But she's not, she's not really presenting. I didn't know <laughs> Um, in our classrooms for the last two and a half years uh, since our last literacy adoption. And um, you were, of course, just introduced to what, what I'm thinking of as our unstoppable writing teachers. Um, these amazing professionals have shown so much dedication and the results with their students and the excitement they've generated. Um, it's been truly amazing. So why the whole focus on writing? Well, let's rewind back to our 2013 literacy program evaluation and two key pieces that came out of that. The first, we we're talking about needing to teach strategies. We needed to integrate our gradual release of responsibility. We need to, needed to make sure our students had an understanding of different audiences and purposes for writing. And then they needed opportunities to emulate really good writing. We do that through examples, through working together, and by using mentor texts in writing. But perhaps the most interesting finding that came out of the research was that students are most likely to become effective writers when the teacher creates an engaged community of writers. So this includes frequent opportunities for choice, for collaboration, and for feedback. And that feeds right into our current focus on social-emotional learning 
and the fact that we are social creatures and we have those connections and that collaboration in the classroom, then it supports our learning in very powerful ways. So these findings created the need for a paradigm shift for us. So in the past, we had lots of writing programs. Um, those of you who have taught in our schools and have taught writing, Mrs. Nels, I know you'll recognize some of these. And uh, if you've had students <laughs> who have gone through the schools, these uh, programs may resonate with you. Things like the hamburger paragraph, which you see pictured up here, mountain language, write traits, umbrella writing, six plus one traits, lots of different programs. They were pretty formulaic. We did a lot of diagramming. We chunked writing into pieces and then put it back together and hoped to get effective pieces of writing from our students. Um, if you wrote an essay and you got a grade on it, you might not know why you got that grade and you certainly didn't know how you could improve to get a better grade. And so we know from the research and the findings, we knew we needed to find something that looked a bit different for our writing instruction. So enter the Lucy Calkins Reading and Writing Project. This is out of Columbia University. And our textbook adoption committees in 2014 for elementary and middle school both recommended that we adopt the units of study for teaching writing. And this is a program that has a very solid scope and sequence to it, but it looks very different from anything we'd ever tried before in writing. And one thing that really resonated with members of the committee at that time was that Lucy Calkins encourages us to teach the writer, but not the writing. And so when we think about the heart of what we do with our students, we're focusing on the writer, and the writing follows. So here's why we love Lucy. There's a workshop model, first of all. And you know, we've talked about workshop models in our reading instruction. We have workshop model in mathematics instruction, um, both at the elementary and the middle level, and in our high school in some places as well. And within that workshop model, we teach a mini lesson. There's conferring. We use writing partners, have lots of small group work. There's always a mid-workshop teaching point integrated, so we have that direct instruction piece. And there are lots of opportunities to share. And again, that takes us right back to that community of engaged writers. And then our writing is assessment-driven and goal-based. So we have a pre-kindergarten through grade nine learning progression, which is a progression of skills that remains consistent for students as they cycle through those grades. And we have assessment rubrics and student checklists, which are very, very important to the next point, which is that this program is differentiated for our students, which is uh, differentiating writing instruction is very difficult to do, but it's something that's very necessary as well. And this is standards aligned with a scope and sequence, and uh, it has embedded professional development for us as well. So what you're seeing now is an example of this learning progression that I referred to. So what you uh, are viewing is the learning progression for argument writing. And it begins at grade three, I believe, and moves up through grade nine. So it's just a chunk of that learning progression. But if you look at the qualities of writing for <clears throat> um, argument or opinion writing, you'll see there's an overall expectation and then a lead and transitions and an ending and then the organization. And then you'll see very clear descriptors of what that might look like at third grade and then at fourth grade and then at fifth grade. So this particular scored piece of writing on the learning progression was for a sixth grade student. And you can see by the green boxes that most of the writing fell within the sixth grade expectation, which again is aligned with our standards. But there were some parts of the writing that fell below and some that even exceeded expectations. So in terms of setting goals for students, for students owning the writing and knowing, knowing what the next steps would be for uh, feeding the learning forward, they can use this learning progression as can the teacher. And parents also can have access to this and know exactly here's where my student was and here's what I need to feed the learning forward. And that's very important to that differentiation piece. Student checklists are also included in the program. This takes the exact verbiage from the learning progression. It translates it for our kindergarten students into visual images so they know what we're looking for and they can uh, self-reflect and set goals for improving. You can see the second grade for the same set of skills and then the sixth grade checklist up there too. Those are really um, wonderful tools for our students in our elementary classrooms. We even have these blown up
and on the walls in the classrooms across the district so that teachers can reference them while they're teaching and students can own the elements on the checklist. And then finally, we have something called the if-then curriculum, which is a very intriguing piece in all of this. And so what Lucy does is tells us, here's something that you might look for in writing. And if this is what the student is doing, then this is what you could do to differentiate and help the student to move his or her performance forward. It's really specific. It gives us great suggestions. And again, it gives us that piece of differentiation that we're looking for within our writing program. So before we get going, one thought, Lucy tells us, and she's very, very poetic, that writers grow like oak, tree, oak trees in the fullness of time. And for any teacher to bring her students to the ambitious levels that are crucial for 21st century success, the students need the opportunity also to grow over time. To truly prepare students for the future requires a school-wide, cross-grade commitment to teaching and assessing writing. And this program allows us to have that school-wide, cross-grade level commitment across all grade levels in our district from kindergarten through eighth grade, which is really important. So let's start with our very youngest learners in kindergarten. Hi, I'm Becky White. I teach kindergarten at Forest Dale. And I think some of you might say writing in kindergarten, really? Well, um, you'll see that, and I've seen the same thing coming down from upper grades, is that they really do grow every day as a writer. And each of our units are centered towards the child. They give them the opportunity to really focus on what's important to them and to be able to write what they know. Um, we begin by telling writers the very first day that they're authors and their eyes get really big, like, me, an author, and we read fun books and we talk to them about, this is what you're going to do. You're going to write books. You're going to illustrate your books. You're going to tell us all about what you know. And then um, from there we start with just picture writing and then being able to add a label to it so that people who look at it can tell what they're drawing and writing. And then making sure that they grow as writers and move forward in not only the phonics and the phonemic awareness, but it helps them grow as readers because they really see the purpose behind what they're doing and connecting those two together. So here is a quick video of some things that are happening inside my classroom. There's four different students featured in the video from varying different learning abilities, from learning how to sound out words and find letters to writing books about cells. So um, I don't know what I clicked to hit play. To get my video, click enter and then go on. Oh, there we go. So this first student is someone who's learning how to sound out words um, and using our Orton Gillingham phonics program. And some other things that we do. Yeah, do you remember how to spell I? I Let's do that one and then I'll help you with the rest of the words. Do I, just like you did here. I. Yeah. Ready? Good. I. I got. G. What says G like goat? Do you know what that letter is? G like goat. G. 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 Goat. There you go. G. Goat. G. Put your hand out. G. Ah. What says ah? What says ah? What says ah, Josiah? Like ah. What says ah, like ah? Ah. Oh, can you make an O? I know you know how to make that letter. That letter's in your name. I told them. Oh, no, 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 no. G. Ah. What says? Can I give you one tip? When we're writing, we want to make sure that our words match our picture. So your words say, my family, sister, mom, Savannah, but your picture is of a giraffe. A giraffe. So, what could we do um, to Savannah. help your picture? You're writing narratives about you places they've gone or things they've done. My family, sister, mom, Savannah, like saw a 
You're right. You're right. Could you add that so that your words match your picture? Wait, how do you spell it? I'll help you with that. And this is more towards the end of our first unit that we've done on narratives. So they've really come a long way as far as what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Okay, tell me who's on the cover. Yeah. My mama, me, my brother, and my other mom. Oh, okay. And so um, if you were going to label so that I know who each person is, how could you label? Mm -hmm. the same mama. Mm -hmm. but I label me. Could you put in, what does mama start with? M, and then, uh, oh. M, O, F. Yeah, I know that question. <laughs> what are you writing about? This is my book called Cell. It teaches you all about DNA and other things that your body's made of. Can you read me your book? <laughs> read me what you wrote. Open. Adam makes things. Adams makes things. White blood cell fights. Work or cell. D A N A. This is the part I'm working on. So there's just a quick glimpse of what narrative writing looks like in kindergarten. And I wish I had a piece that just showed you what they did on their very first on-demand writing, where they couldn't write words. They could draw pictures, but it was hard to tell what it was. And then to really see what they've done at this point is pretty impressive. So I will turn it over to Amy Morrison. Nope, you don't want to watch that again. Hang on. I don't know how to stop it. <laughs> well, hi, I'm Amy Morrison, second grade teacher. I've been in um, Carmel Clay School since 98, so I'm pretty well seasoned. And um, one of the things that um, I think that is really important is the idea of conferring with students. But it can also be the most overwhelming as a teacher, because as teachers, we want to fix everything. We see an issues in their writing and we sit down and it's like, oh, I see spelling and capitals and end marks and all of these different things. But what we learn with conferring with Lucy is that we want to just really focus in and hone in on one thing that we can do with our students. Because what we've learned is that students really do it, really succeed the most or succeed when the teacher sits with that child and gives them a specific thing to work on in their writing instead of just getting a, a piece back with all these editing marks. And I've done that. I've been around a while, so I've learned as I've gone on. So through the conference, what um, we do is we first kind of talk to the student and think about what specifically we want to teach. What is one thing we want that student to walk away from that conference and go back and apply right away. And so through that, my students go through and they do a checklist and they decide what they think they need to work on. I go through that same checklist, look at what they think they did well and what they need to improve on. I have my own opinion and then we come up together with one thing that I want them to work on. So I have my friend Jake. And Jake wrote a great narrative. We're all working on narratives right now. And I just found that one area that he and I actually really disagreed upon was his ending. He said he wrote a great ending. And when I looked at it, it wasn't what I wanted his ending to be. So you're going to see that he and I are going to have a discussion only about the ending of his story. Even though I saw other things in his writing that could be improved, I know Jake's seven and he's still growing as a writer and that was the one thing I really wanted him to walk away with knowing how to do better in this conference. So here's Mr. Jake. Is I took your book home and I went through your book and I looked at your checklist and you checked off how you felt you were doing on each of these parts and your structure, your development, and your convention. So looking at narrative um, and then looking at the editing. I checked out one okay? So we went through and I agreed with you down here, you but I want to take a look at some of these things up here. And specifically what I want to work with you today on is your ending. Here we go. You and I disagreed about your ending. You thought that you 
made a really great so thing. this is the checklist where um, I looked at your I checked how I thought he did, did and then he checked how he thought he did. So you and I are going to focus on the ending in our conference today. Remember when we're working on our endings? What we're trying to do is we're trying to make them memorable. And the idea is we want to bring our endings back to our story, what our topic was, and we want to wrap it up in the end. So we've talked about how you can share a lesson that you learned, you can share a laugh, you can ask a question at the end, you can think about the future, how you feel, or you could bring it all together by telling how you felt in the end. So when I read the end of your story about going on the river, you kind of went to a new moment. You started to write about how you went home and how you went to bed. And to me, that doesn't really talk about going on the river. It tells me a different moment about what you were doing at the end of your story. Now, in this story, what were some feelings that you had? You thought it was exciting. How else did you feel in the story? Uh, kind of sad. When were you feeling sad? Uh, Okay. The rocks were cool and bumpy. And you, I saw those different emotions in your story. You were excited, but you were scared because of the bumpiness. And so we got to think at the end, like, let's look at these. Which ones do you think probably might be good for you at the ending of your story? If you were to get rid of a couple, which one do you think might be good? Yeah, I don't think ask a question would be good either. Any others that you think might not work well with this story? That's the one I was thinking. This wasn't really a funny story, was it? This was a scary story. This was something that you definitely had fun with, but it was also scary. So do you think you want to share what you learned by doing this adventure? Maybe what might happen in the future? Or just in the end, how you felt about the whole thing? What might happen in the future? So talk to me about that. What do you think might happen in the future? So you actually said, will I ever want go on it again? And that was not only in the future, but you also, you asked a question, didn't you? So let's take a look at this. We finished. We finally found the dots and we stopped, okay? After you stopped, I want you to take me to that moment. Let's not go home, right? You found the dots and you stopped. What happened after you stopped? That's a new moment, so let's just leap to the board it up. You got off, right? You got off. Let's talk about that. Let's wrap it up at the end, magnify that moment of you getting off of it, and then let's do your ending that you just came up with, where you asked a question, but you gave a hint about the future. So we are going to actually rewrite your whole ending. Do you see this page? We're going to leave that one alone. So your job as a writer now is to go back to your seat and rework this ending. So that way we can move it from here to saying that you really thought that about that ending and you chose one of these endings to work on. Okay? All right. So that's your job. So I'm going to have you go work on that as a writer. Okay? Thanks, Jake. And that was the ending he came up with. I stopped and took a deep breath is my favorite part. So anyway, so that's just a little glimpse of conferring. And with second graders especially, they want to write more like a list. I went here, and then I went here, and then I went here, and then I went here. But this allowed us to really focus in on one moment and wrap up just that one moment of, of his day. So, thanks. Okay, so we are going to have you guys engage as our students. And so, is it all right if I ask them to come join us? And um, we, Julie is actually going to really be taking you through this fifth grade narrative lesson. And what you're going to see is that she's going to start her mini lesson, and this is how, this is the same structure all of our mini lessons follow. That we connect to what's been done in the past, so that kids know where, where they've been and where they're going. She will then model a strategy for you. She will um, get you engaged in whatever that strategy is before you leave her. 
and start writing on your own. And then she will link it to the future that this isn't just for today, for this piece of writing, but this is something you can do with all writing that you do. Okay? Take it away, Julie. Thank you for time. I will have to get ready. <laughs> so, writers, last week I gave you a pretty daunting task. I had you stare down that white piece of paper in your notebook, and I said, You have 45 minutes to write an entire story in one writing workshop. And so as I watched your pens rushing through the page, I thought, oh, this is a class of storytellers, people who have things to say and things to share. And so when I took it in and cuddled up on the couch with them, and of course, inevitably, the dog found his way to the pile, as he does, I read through your words and I realized, there's a lot here. Some of the things you wrote made me laugh, and others made me cry. So I thank you for being so generous with your writing, because that's exactly what writing workshop is. This is a place to truly be honest with who you are, and so by sharing those stories with me, I feel like I already know who you are. But I'd like to point to John Jakes, an American writer, who said these words. Be yourself. Above all, let who you are, what you are, what you believe shine through every sentence you write, and these are going to be essential to our work as writers, and especially in our narrative unit. So today as we begin to work on new pieces of writing, I want to remind you that you already know strategies. You carry those with you. And so I have hung a chart front and center because we'll be referring to this from time to time. And so I'd like you to take a moment to read the first check to the person next to you, and then I want you to answer yes or no. This is a strategy I have tried to generate true stories before. How do we do this? <laughs> this is an elbow button. One, two. I could do this. It's okay. Get a triple. Try after five. Okay. Okay. You're tripping. Okay. I can't read it to you. Think of a person who matters to you and just small moments where you can take him and her and write them. Well, we could change the angle of the papers. We just had to say if we tried this before. Yes. Oh, yes, I have. So my children seen some shrugs and stretches, and you know what? If you haven't tried this before, that's okay. Because today you're going to be introduced to a new strategy. <laughs> and this is one that will help you write incredibly powerful stories. So powerful stories, we always begin by jotting moments that have been turning points. These could be first times or last times, and then we're going to take one of those moments from our list of ideas, and we're going to write fast and furious to get it out of our system. So let me first show you step by step how to use these strategies by thinking of first times, last times, and then times that we realize something. So I have started the chart over here. And I'm going to write what comes to mind. So I'm thinking first times. Well, something I do a lot, or used to do a lot, was perform. So I think the first time I performed on stage instead of in my mirror or with air guitar in the bathroom, I think of the first time on stage terribly nervous. See, and you 
important thing is that theory is out of my system, and so it doesn't matter how it looks because later this is going to turn into a story. And to the first time, I thought about changing careers to do something that made me laugh, and that's teaching. Doing that, I was looking for joy at the top of my things and I filled with learning the stories. And so now that I have done that, I might want to think of class times. And so to do that, I'm going to use the same structure and the same ideas and just hopefully they will blow out of me. And sometimes these are sad moments. So I might consider the last time I said goodbye to my grandpa. And I remember the things that he said this fall. Uh, he made a remark about the current state of politics. He complimented my scarf and then he reminded me that I should always be clever because that doesn't go away the age. I think I know the way, 
and after 15 minutes of circling and mascara streaming down my cheeks, I realized that I'm going to have to ask for help. So in doing that, that's okay. People are available for you. You just have to ask.
hope that you are seeing that when you want to pick a topic and you need to generate ideas, it can help to think about turning points. So let's link this to what you'll be doing next. So I want to remind you that writers draw from an invisible backpack of strategies that you all carry with you, whether you know it or not. And so you may use one of these strategies that we have introduced today, others that you could use in the past, or ones that will continue to work with this week. And so remember, when given that task, you can always consider a turning point. And so for today, I'm going to ask you to take one of those turning point moments and write your story, fast and furious. We're gonna make sure that our storytelling builds with momentum. You might be writing an entire page. And if another idea is begging to be told, you may continue drafting or start another story from your list. <laughs> Looking ahead, later in writing workshop, we will have a surface of compliments for all of the work that we are already doing. We will get back together and share. And we'll consider thinking to get some the pendulum of writing and we'll make some res resolutions to make this year's writing workshop the best. What are we supposed to do now? Right? <laughs> 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 you have homework. Yes. Write story. <laughs> I'm yelling into you. <laughs> <laughs> so perhaps you might have. So really, we're writing a paper now? Oh. <laughs> 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 you're going to need some coffee or something. using the Lucy Hopkins curriculum or style?
she would happily just sit on the back carpet and listen to to many like she just she thinks it's like story time because it is but you are teaching them to think reflectively as a writer and so that has been the big shift for me and i think i think for them it's a bit of a risk to do it. Well, that's what I noticed even the earlier, you know, grade levels, is it seems like it's not um, so much a right or wrong, but just an awareness of the process, just being aware of, like being in the moment of my moment is okay, and then go with it. And, and going with the flow. And I think because of how it's done, they know I'm not going to harp on conventions if my, my focus is in fact on generating an idea or um, hoping a reader through an introduction. And I think because of that, they will tell you what, what they're working toward. You have a line, that goal, and that vision. And then that's sort of the, the same discussion. And they'll get feedback from other peers to be able to refine the other elements, but it's not so comprehensive where it, it's a burden. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I think you're pretty cool. <laughs> Would you all like to stay there? Yes. Rather than move? <laughs> okay. All right, well, so we're going to switch to the middle school, but man, that made me want to go back to fifth grade. <laughs> I've got to tell you, that was amazing. Um, mini lessons, and I think we're going to talk a little bit about mini lessons, but they do look similar to that also at the um, middle grade. So I think Rachel is going to talk a little bit about that. But two qualities that we really see come out at the middle school level with the Lucy Calkins philosophy is both rigor and choice. And by rigor, we don't necessarily mean that the work gets more academic or it gets more difficult or they have to write longer pieces. That's not what we mean by rigorous, but the kids are asked to take these fundamental ideas that they have about writing that they've learned at the elementary levels, and they're asked to apply those in increasingly sophisticated ways and also apply those to more real-world contexts. So... At the middle grades, we have a lot of genre spiraling, and I think they probably do this at the elementary, but you all mostly just stuck with the narrative. But we do have the narrative and the information and argument writing, and those three types of writing spiral throughout all three grade levels. And so kids visit those types of writing at each grade. But the task that they're asked to do becomes um, more rigorous, kind of co more complex, and then they're also asked to apply it in real-world contexts. So I'm going to take the information writing. At the sixth grade level this year, um, our teachers decided to utilize the PBL model, and they're actually doing a cross-disciplinary information studies on invasive species through their science classes. So they're going to tackle a real-world problem using the research component from their science classes and then the research and information writing component from the Calkins. And so it's a really nice uh, thematic blend in a cross-disciplinary way. At the seventh grade level this year, they're utilizing the makerspace, which you're probably familiar with. And the kids have got in, in kind of this experimental play and taught themselves how to do the things in the makerspace. And then they're writing um, information writing and brochures and infographics on how they utilize the makerspace, which is pretty neat. And then at the eighth grade level, the information writing becomes a position paper where students um, investigate a topic of interest to them, and then they find a real-world application for that, whether it's the mayor or the principal or the CEO of a corporation, and they send those letters or they post that blog to try to change someone's mind about the topic that they've just investigated. So it becomes very um, authentic in that sense, which adds a layer of rigor. And of course, it's embedded in choice because the kids get to choose the topics that they want to do and things that matter to them, which creates curiosity and then also increases stamina for the task. So and I'm going to turn it over to Rachel. Now she's going to talk a little bit about seventh grade. Yes, so to give you guys an idea of what this looks like in the seventh grade classroom, um, it really comes down to making their writing experience authentic from the very beginning, the brainstorming process, to the very end where they're publishing or sharing their work um, in whatever way that may be. Um, so I just want to hit on a couple key elements um, that have just proven to be really effective in narrative writing as well this first quarter in seventh grade. 
Um, so for the brainstorm process to kick off our narrative unit, um, Carly Sauer, our media uh, center specialist, came in um, and just shared a story and just just like you just did, just engage the entire classroom um, in a pretty hilarious story of, of a lesson she had to kind of learn the hard way. Um, she had gone to a storytelling workshop in the spring of last year and applied some of the things that she learned from that conference in, right there in the classroom. Um, and then the brainstorming process kind of took off from there and it was kind of funny to see some of the things that you guys are using in some of the um, younger grade levels we're also using in middle school some of the things that we told students to think about as they're brainstorming as important people to you important places to you first times last times um, moments with heightened emotion for them to kind of think about different lessons they've learned or different stories they have to tell and I think one of the key things um, for all kids but especially in middle school to to get that engagement and to get that buy-in especially for students who don't see themselves as writers or who are very hesitant to write um, is to give them choice and so the brainstorming process really allowed for that in them choosing different key moments um, that they wanted to share and that they see purpose in sharing um, before even entering into our writing unit we read the outsider outsiders um, which in itself is a narrative um, and so that was kind of used as their mentor text so as much as we were writing in our own writers notebooks they also had their outsiders open as a mentor text to see, okay, how does this main character introduce other characters or describe the setting or um, create this plot for us to follow. Um, we tied in thinking maps where they kind of mapped out their central character, which was themselves. And that was a really cool reflective process for them to not only put their age in there and their physical description, but we asked them to kind of take themselves out of that story and put themselves in a boring, everyday, routine moment, because most of my seventh graders think that they have boring lives and no stories to tell, but once they took themselves out of the need to come up with this exciting story and saw what their inner thoughts looked like in a routine, everyday moment, um, they were able to um, kind of take their characters to another level where they developed some strengths and weaknesses and fears and desires and goals and motivations and so that was really cool to see them um, take that a whole nother level farther. So the brainstorm process um, was kind of the first bend of um, the narrative um, in seventh grade. And then once they have that draft, um, really focusing in on those targeted skills, having very specific mini lessons where we're really focusing in um, whether you want to see it as one standard or one strand of their rubric, one part of their checklist um, is really a focus for them. This could be done in the format of mini lessons. I love to use stations in my classroom. Um, I think this is a great way um, to group students in different ways, um, whether those are whether they're grouped with students with similar strengths or with differing strengths, where they go around and some of them are, are very independent, where they're applying something directly to their draft. And some of the stations allow for a small group instruction where I can be sitting down with a smaller group of students. Um, but it really gives them an opportunity to really zoom in on one part of that checklist. And the self-assessment and peer assessment is one of my favorite things to watch in the middle school classroom. Um, watching students interact with each other about their writing, um, I think they finally show an ownership over something, um, especially for hesitant writers who kind of started off saying that they didn't even have a story to share. It's really cool to see them share that story with another um, student. Um, and we group them, some teachers group them using NWA data, and so their partners are um, people who have at first I marked I pair them with people who have similar strengths and then again with a peer who has different strengths so that they are getting feedback um, from someone who can kind of encourage them because they're in the same um, level I suppose and then someone who they can teach that um, skill to on a different level in a different way um, the rubrics that Calkins uses are really easily transferable to checklists where they can simply mark yes I've done this or no I have not I love the language across the rubric. It says, not yet, starting to, yes, or over the top. And that, that kind of correlates with that learning progression that you saw earlier. Um, so seventh grade would be yes, eighth grade would be over the top. And so those are how they um, are creating those goals. Um, students have a conference where they um, go through this checklist and have a verbal discussion with each other about strengths they see in their writing, which we call glows in the classroom, and then areas for improvement, which we call grows in the classroom. 
Um, and then they end up assessing themselves um, where they give themselves a grade and we end up having a conference before they even turn that in. Um, and that really, I think, provides the opportunity for growth mindset where they see this is what I have done, this is what I'm still going to continue to improve upon. Um, and after our conference, they have about another day or at least half of a block um, to go back to any place that they marked not yet or starting to they have an opportunity to to bump themselves up to that yes or over the top. Um, and so that's a little bit of what it looks like in the seventh grade classroom. So at the middle school, they kind of like to chat with each other a little bit. <laughs> no, they do. Um, so really seeing that as a strength and building in a community of writers is really important for student engagement. Um, learning is a social construct, as we know, and so it's really important for them to have lots of opportunities to confer with one another with those writing partners. Um, eighth grade, I still sit with them on the floor in a mini lesson, and that's probably me, sorry. Um, and I use the learning progression, and each one of those descriptors on the learning progression can become a mini lesson. Now not every child, this is an honors class, not every kid in the honors class is going to need a mini lesson on every one of the skills because sometimes they have it already, which some of that you can assess um, ahead of time through the on-demand writing and you know they may already have achieved grade level mastery of something from that learning progression. But you pull, ba pull kids back into the carpet and they still sit on the floor even in the eighth grade and we do uh, work back at our mini lesson station. I say meet me on the carpet and they come back with their writer's notebooks and we sit there together. I frame everything around essential questions. That's really big at the middle, middle grades um, because it ties in with some of the Cornell note taking that we're doing and the summarizing. So I frame everything around essential question, but it, the, the question comes straight from a target from the Calkins, um learning progression. So how can I strengthen my claim? That the students were writing literary analysis on the book thief is what they were doing. So how can I strengthen my claim by acknowledging another view? So they're trying to put a counter argument into their literary um, analysis of a theme. And so we talked through very specific things that they could do in their writing in order to strengthen their claim in their writing. And we talked about counter argument. They had their drafts in front of them. So even as they were in the mini lesson, I was asking them to point out places in their drafts where they knew that they needed to go back and make these corrections. Um, they do work with writing partners, and I do that based on a variety of factors, the magic of teachers who know how to pair people, you know, that's what we do. Um, but sometimes they have similar skills levels, sometimes it's people I know they'll work well with or who will challenge them in a good way. Um, they frequently collaborate with each other, and it's always related specifically to the skill that's just been taught in the mini lesson. It's opportunities for their, them to rehearse the skills verbally, which they love to do that, before they actually take them and put them into their writing. Um, so it's a great opportunity for that. So this is when they're getting ready to practice their counter argument. I gave them some um, sentence frames to use in their conversation with one another that they could then put directly into their writing after they had a chance to rehearse. So these are um, some students that were practicing rehear or rehearsing their counter argument for their literary theme analysis. Shaker swing time that we're using words instead of weapons to cover this instruction. So I think this really does, a counter argument I'd say is that this doesn't really support your team because it doesn't let Liesl find refuge in words. However, it makes Liesl aware that all the words are uh, I'd say like a counter argument for you is like whoever Lisa finds refuge in the words because she begins to come with terms of how the world is around her and why it makes sense. So going along with my theme, uh, friendship strengthens through building sex. So the example I have between 
really offline and based on is that um, when he starts coming in and reading and teaching her when she has nightmares, that it creates kind of a reliable um, base of their friendship in a time of like war and everything they go through. Um, so, do you think there's a counter argument for why that wouldn't be a really nice I think that there should be a counterexample or a counterargument right here because he said that uh, when she met uh, Hans, Max, Rudy, and Rosa, it like greatly outweighed the loss of her family. And I think that you could put a counterexample like, however, they still, or like, well, some might argue that losing your family would be such a great loss and such a huge experience that you've never been able to do it and that like would keep you sad for a really long time the text says that like she becomes more more fond with new people that she meets and she like develops better relationships with people like Max and Hans 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 and I just think that with like a counter example you could strengthen that point like extend this paragraph so it's really exciting to see them having such fun um, engaged conversations about their writing and with one another totally student initiated and student directed so it's pretty exciting Okay, so we have, just to wrap it up, just a very short clip here, some final words of wisdom. And this is a young lady from the town meadow, elementary. We'll have to turn the sound up. I hope it's not too loud so you can hear her. Uh, before, so before we did this unit, how would you rate this to five on, just like, how well you liked writing? I would rate myself a one or a two. I didn't, I didn't really like writing because I n could never think of a topic and the words just didn't come to me. And how about now? What would you rate yourself now, just a five, on how well you just like writing or look forward I, to it? I would rate myself a five. What? I used to want to be like an inventor or a chef, but now I want to be an author since I've learned these strategies. Cool. <laughs> So it really doesn't get any better than that in terms of writing instruction where you have students who really look forward to becoming authors. They really are authors the minute they step into this program. So that's the conclusion of our presentation, but we'll be happy to see if you have questions. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I'll start with thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm really excited about this program because like Kathy, I'm more math and science. I'm like, oh, I could do this. And um, so I like how it's probably giving our students a, a different perspective on how they can be authors. And um, each of your ideas, and I know they, they go along with the curriculum, but you presented them so nicely. Um, I know you do that in the classroom as well, so thank you for that. I just am thrilled and excited um, and the fact we've been doing this for a couple of years I think it's clearly evident at least in my home with my three boys uh, my William who has never been the strongest of writers is um, he comes home with some pieces and I'm like oh, that's very exciting I'm not quite sure how you did that but I'm very proud of you <laughs> so that's pretty exciting so thank you yes and I think one thing that probably was obvious that we've discovered as we've implemented the program we began at least at the elementary level with saying teachers please implement one unit there are four units in a year for the, for uh, within the program please implement one unit get your feet wet give this a try and we said please start with the narrative unit um, this is we started out by saying this was very arduous it is very time consuming for teachers to read through all of the instructional information that goes with a unit to implement it to figure out how to do a mini lesson 
in 10 minutes as opposed to a 45 minute mini lesson. You can see how that could explode and take quite a bit of time. The pacing, the content, just the whole change in the paradigm and how we're teaching writing, it really has been a journey for teachers. So we started small and as we got into it, we realized there is a hefty scope and sequence embedded within this program. We knew that was important. We knew it was there, but we didn't realize how important it was until we got going. And we realized that what our kindergarten students were learning with narrative, with opinion, and informational writing cycled into first grade. And what happened in first grade depended on what happened in kindergarten. And then in second grade, we referenced back to first grade experience in kindergarten, and in third grade, and so on. And so the spiral was so amazing, we realized we needed to get on board and be teaching all four units if we really wanted to leverage the power of the program. So we are now in our third year of the program, been teaching it for two and a half years. So. This is our third year, and this year we've asked elementary teachers to teach all four units. And it's a journey of growth because it can't be perfect the first time out, and we're willing to take risks and do this in our classrooms. And what we're hearing from teachers, where they're implementing, is that the impact on students is amazing. And I see heads shaking, yes. So it's a lot of work, and it's been a journey, but it's been fabulous. Our middle school friends implemented four units from the get-go across the school year, so hats off in terms of jumping in and breathing life into the program. But now that we know our students can um, enjoy this approach in this program from kindergarten through eighth grade. We are so excited and we can't wait for those students to cycle up into the high school so our high school colleagues can build on, on the wonderful things that have happened. The other thing I'd like to add, I do feel like this really empowers the students with their own success. Um, and with that empowerment, I really feel like that kind of supports our whole initiative of you know, social emotional growth because yes. they just feel far better about what they're doing. So thank you. I just wanted to say thank you very much too. This was this was awesome. Oh. Just to give you a little background on my writing experience, <laughs> <laughs> I teach math. <laughs> but when I was in high school, we had this thing called the F list, and it was a list of words that if you used even one of them, you got an automatic F on your mm -hmm. paper. This does not emphasize the joy of writing <laughs> to a young person who gets a little bit tense about getting a good grade. So I am excited, like Layla, to see this program in our, in our schools and the opportunity it's going to give our students and how it's going to open up. I mean, we probably will see some of our students will be authors in the future mm -hmm. and will be buying their best sellers. And I think it's a great that you're all so enthusiastic about it and hopefully that they can become balanced and learn re writing and reading and even a little math along the way, but writing we'll is a We'll make sure there's skill. a little bit of math along the way, too. <laughs> yes. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, having been in the classroom myself for many years, I w went through all of those programs that were up there on the screen, and I have always enjoyed teaching writing and got into every single one of those programs, um, Shirley included. Not sure how many of you taught Shirley. Um, but um, my, my question also is, we are making good writers, but who is going to be the editor for those writers? Because all good writers have editors and we still need to be teaching the mechanics and the, the spelling. And so where is that coming into play here? So, and I welcome anyone to join me. Um, so when we're teaching, thinking about mechanics and grammar, that instruction is embedded within the Calkins Writing Workshop and that um, instruction occurs within the mini lesson and in conferring with a student. So not all students need all of the same things. So uh, done within context of actual writing and through um, understanding how grammar and mechanics plays out in mentor texts. Um, so again, in a very meaningful way within the context as opposed to what we used to do, which would be worksheets, daily oral grammar, that kind of thing in isolation, which oftentimes did not translate actually to writing. So um, we also have for spelling, that's a part of our reading program, and we also have um, additional programs. Orton helps, to, helps teach the uh, sound symbol association, the phonemes, 
um, embedded in spelling, so we come at that through our reading program as well. But again, all of that embedded in the authentic context of the actual writing that students are doing. We agree, those are important skills. They're tested skills. There are standards for those. We don't ignore those, but we like to do it within this context. Can I add to that? Is that okay? On the checklist that I was doing with Jake, most of the top of it was, but mainly what you guys saw today with the process of learning, but the whole bottom checklist is attitude checklist. So he rated himself on spelling, capitalization, punctuation, and complete sentences. And what I thought he needed at that time was working on the ending because Jake has all those skills. But I'm thinking of a student in my head right now, Madison, when I conference with her, I couldn't even understand her reading because of her sentence structure. So when we met, it was focusing on the mechanics of her writing, just to make it, we need capitals, we need end marks. And that's when I focused on her conference because I couldn't even understand her writing because none of that was in there. So that's the great thing about Lucy, is they read themselves, and it gives us the opportunity to say, what does Jake need? What does Madison need? And if Jake doesn't need that, I'm going to focus on something else. And then, of course, they're learning, and we're building on it as the year goes on. You just didn't get the chance for to see that, but it is part of the Lucy checklist, and one thing that we do break themselves on, as well as the, um, the actual content of what they write. They do like that, too. And in a very similar way, in the fourth grade, like, like you saw Julie do today, like, oh, this is going to make your writing so powerful. We teach paragraphing the same way. Your writing is going to be amazing when you read these paragraphs. Because it'll be so <laughs> easy to read. And they eat that right up too. But they go into their own writing and they start boxing in where they think their paragraphs should be. So um, instead of looking at, like Martha said, like a, a you know, worksheet of where should the paragraphs go, they're going into their I still have a concern about it um, because I remember teaching whole language and balanced literature and I, there wasn't enough of that within the programs that we used to use and so you would have to supplement with other things to try to uh, make them better at doing those particular things. Um, and I realize Lucy Calkins is a huge program. I've read a lot about it before we came here tonight. Um, read pros and cons on the program. It's very lengthy. Um, the pr preparation is, is long. Um, uh, I, I read one article that said Lucy Calkins is insane. <laughs> Um, but um, so it was it was just very interesting to see the pros and cons of the program and I know in the past we've gone through programs and we're going wow this is the great program you know this is the program to end all beat all and yes it is for a while and then turns around I remember times when Amy used to come into our classrooms and as our principal and say um, I've got this great new program for you, and she'd try to explain it to us, and we were all experienced teachers, and we'd all look at her and say, oh yeah, we've already done this, but it was called this. And then she'd go, oh. <laughs> so. yeah, but I think, Pam, yeah, the point is, though, Lucy Calkins is, <laughs> um, Lucy Calkins it has, it's not, yes, this is the program that we have, but if you really would research, I mean, Lucy is definitely the writing guru. She has the writing college at Columbia. Yeah, I where, read all that. You know, we have um, a couple, actually, of our teachers that are um, going to go to the writing college, but this is not something that's just kind of a, an easy thing to do, and, you know, the research that she has put behind this, this program, this is um, not... What, as you said, you know, the whole language movement. This is very much, as Amy pointed out, it has both the process of writing plus the mechanics. And research is very clear that teaching skills in isolation does not help them to transfer it to the writing. However, teaching the skills within the writing certainly does help them to transfer. And, so, and that's what this program is doing, and this is what our teachers are doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And yes, as Martha pointed out, yes, it is. There's a lot to it. I mean, 
she Lucy is very verbose. Mm -hmm. She, um, but it's 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 also very engaging. And as you know, one of the things our coaches do is really work alongside of our teachers to help. How do we pull this apart, and how do we make this in digestible chunks? And as Martha said, you know, we started small, and now you know, after two and a half years into it, we are we're moving forward. And that's the piece that's so exciting to see our kids be very excited about writing and to see their writing to truly improve from when we used to do curly mm -hmm. or when, from when we used to do the umbrella writing. Mm -hmm. This this is true authentic writing that we see from our kids. Does this translate to the Indiana skills, the Indiana core um, the, standards uh, and, the, and the I step test? The uh, progression, the learning progression, which is the, the big progression of skills which translates to the scoring rubrics and the checklists. That's aligned, was originally aligned with the Common Core State Standards and then with Indiana's academic standards. So yes, it's aligned with our Indiana standards. And then um, we also use our NWA continuum to track and monitor those skills as well. So there, we do not want to compromise grammar, our, our students' achievement in grammar and mechanics and spelling, but we have these checks built in so the continuum is aligned with the standards. We can monitor that closely. The nice thing with Lucy is students can self-monitor and own that themselves. And then we use the NWEA as a triangulation point for that in terms of our data. So I think we're, uh, it's, it's a valid point, but I believe we're monitoring for that. We feel like we have instructional resources for that. And I guess, again, the proof's in the pudding. What are we seeing in our students' writing? And I would have to defer to our middle school colleagues here and, and ask, is grammar, are grammar and mechanics generally an issue for our students as they cycle up to middle school? We'll continue to monitor. Do they still, uh, does I-STEP still do a prompt writing like it used to, or is that changed? I, a, I, I'm asking because I don't know. For applied skills, yes. It's still a prompt? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I just want to say, it, it, I really like the process, the, the uh, like ownership and the power you were talking about that the child takes on themselves, the student takes on themselves through this process. It, um, and it seems like a very fluid process. One day will not ever look like the next day at all. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Is there, there's never like a big lesson? It's all like a carpet time or a small group or an individual consultation? Or how does that fluidity work out in, you know, the real world? Um, Anybody? Well, <laughs> well, what we know about kids is the, is the longer <laughs> Um, the longer they're they're being um, they're we're delivering direct instruction, um, the less time they're on task. Uh -huh. So what the, what happens is during a uh, structure of mini lesson in kindergarten to fifth grade, and probably up to eighth grade too, the mini lessons are kept short because we're giving them a specific goal and we're giving them the tools they need in order to apply whatever it was that they're going to do in that day, and then. That time that they spend writing is where a lot of the real, real impactful teaching is happening because um, teachers are sitting side by side with the kids and giving them very specific feedback um, that's really tailored to what they specifically need as a writer. Some students need mechanics, some students need help flushing out their ideas. And so, um, kids. Some kids are writing about cells and some kids are sounding out words. I think that's the biggest part. Is how differentiated writing can be all of a sudden. Yeah. We used to have all these kids and they were all writing a story about this. And today we're gonna to write this type of sentence. And it's not that way in kindergarten especially. I've got kids that write a big long string of letters. And then I've got kids that are pulling in those phonics pieces from the morning phonics lesson. And then I'm sitting with so and so and they're ready for a full sentence structure all of a sudden. We haven't even talked about sentence structure. So I meet with that person and they're writing sentences. So then when I get to that part in my 
less than about sentences, I have an expert and I go, can you show us an example of what you did and how you wrote that sentence and they feel empowered and the other kids want to be like that person so they go back. And so I think it just really all pieces together so wonderfully that the type of, and in kindergarten, you see this type of writing is amazing. And I think it's just really impressive. But that's what it seems like. So no matter, as, as the student, no matter what level you're on, if you're a really good writer or you're your, your gig is math or what, whatever your brain is, it's okay yeah. as, as long as you're engaged. And it seems like everyone's engaging. They're getting mm -hmm. this buy-in because they have that ownership. And what Julie did would be Enjoy. like the first part of the day, like she would introduce a, a lesson. So what you guys did would be like a whole group lesson and then you'd go off and write. And then she might meet or confer with some of you who were struggling with it, like stay back at the carpet and work with you. And then you stop and you do a mint workshop lesson. So you might then pull the kids together and say, hey, I noticed in your writing, we have this issue, like one day I did it, a lot of kids were starting sentences with and. So we talked about that, I used a student's piece of writing. We went through and talked about how to fix that, how we, you know, don't do that. And so it's like you do a whole group, and they write, and then you might pull a small group, or you might teach a certain point that you see coming up. It's, every year is different. It just depends on what, what you have in your writers. Yeah, versus the umbrella. <laughs> uh, this is a question, kind of. I, I, I'm assuming, and this kind of goes to what we've been discussing, that we are looking at the scores as they come in from my step and things, and, and we're watching to see whether we're stable, improving, or falling. I mean, the success of the program, I think, is partially from scores, but a whole lot more from the buyer taking. I mean, I'd rather see a happy writer. Who maybe misspells a few words, mm -hmm. and then someone who like like me has gone through life and is terrified to put stuff down on paper. <laughs> well, and, and one thing to think about with I step, absolutely, do we look at that as one measure? Sure, but that is one type of writing that is responding to a prompt, mm -hmm. and we know that that is an important piece. The kids need to learn how to respond to a prompt and write. Mm -hmm. um, they're using a lot of the skills. However, that's not the only type of writing. Um, and so it's it's one it's one piece of that that we're that we're certainly looking at, and we're looking. I mean, when we look at our I step and we look at the, the you know, they give them two scores. They give one for process and one for mechanics. Our mechanics, I mean, their scores are really very good. <laughs> Many times, I mean, it's it's but it is that is one type of writing that I think we you know we certainly need to look at. But it's not the be all end all either. Well, I just want to once again say thank you for taking time out of your busy evening schedule to inform us. I suppose sure why you love Lucy. I mean, <laughs> <laughs>